right. I'm thrilled that everyone is here tonight, and I'd like to introduce Professor John William McDonald Agar, which is a very big name for not such a tall person. <laughs> <laughs> John graduated from Monash University Medical School in 1970 and trained in nephrology in Melbourne and at UMass Medical School in Worcester, USA. 1978, he returned to his home city of Geelong, where he established and ran a clinical nephrology practice until his retirement in February 2020. John has published more than 250 peer-reviewed papers and abstracts, four book chapters, two dialysis-related books, one with me, and more than 90 Kidney Views blogs as the hemodialysis advisor and internet consultant to the Wisconsin-based Medical Education Institute since 2010. He has been an invited lecturer on dialysis topics in 16 countries, especially on his three pet subjects, nocturnal home hemodialysis, extended hour and higher frequency hemodialysis, a lot of overlap there, and environment sustainability in dialysis and nephrology, founding the global concepts of green dialysis and green nephrology, which I believe will be a future talk. Among his awards for contributions in nephrology are the Order of Australia Medal, that is Australia's highest honor, the Priscilla Kincaid Smith Medal, the, and the International Society of Hemodialysis is Belut Twardowski Lifetime Achievement Award in Hemodialysis. So thank you very much for coming to speak to us and we are all eager to listen to you. Thank you very much, Dory. Um, I'm going to now try and uh, do the, my best to switch to uh, share screen mode. Let's see that this happens. Host has disabled share screen mode. That's you, Dory. Sorry, just fix that, try again. Uh -huh. uh, where on earth do I go now? Is that working? Good. Um, I do notice on my screen that there are a number of, uh, that the pictures of you all appear down the side. The side. If that happens to you, you can uh, uh, adjust that by the small boxes at the top of the right-hand uh, side of the screen and click on the smallest box. Um, today, I am going to talk to you about the EGFR. Uh, last week, or two weeks ago, um, I did a, a talk on uh, how dialysis works. Um, Dory, I think, has recorded that, and uh, for those of you who were not uh, on that, uh, uh, I'll call it a webinar, uh, you can certainly go back and look at that. I'm not sure. Dory may tell you uh, how to access that at the end of the meeting. Uh, if you have uh, any questions, I suggest you have a pencil and piece of paper beside you so that you can jot things down uh, and ask them at the end of the session. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, what is the EGFR and uh, how might we better use it? Because I think we use it badly uh, and a lot of people don't really understand uh, what the EGFR uh, uh, signifies uh, and uh, how better we might be able to uh, adapt it to uh, an educational role for patients with end stage or uh, approaching end stage kidney disease. Uh, we do spend a lot of time measuring or managing the deep spaces of chronic kidney disease. And I'll call these uh, the last few stages of chronic kidney disease from four uh, to five dialysis. That is 5D means stage five and on dialysis. You can be in stage five, of course, without being on dialysis because stage five signifies uh, this EGFR, which we'll talk more about, uh, of 15 or less. Uh, and most patients, uh, certainly in our country, uh, don't reach dialysis, don't start dialysis till their uh, EGFR is down, usually in the seven to eight range, certainly less than 10. Uh, we also spend a lot of time talking about vascular access, as we should, and dialysis and transplantation, uh, yes, but we don't spend an awful lot of time uh, in the pre-dialysis period or as much time as we should 
in educating, preparing and guiding uh, both patients and more importantly, or as importantly, their families uh, through what is a really a profound um, upheaval that uh, is attached to uh, uh, CKD and its management, particularly as they apply to employability and lifestyle, family and, and social structures. Uh, so this is why I think we need to be, we need to look much more uh, uh, carefully at how we uh, approach dialysis and not just talk about the mechanisms of dialysis and transplantation uh, by themselves. Uh, I have had my times on uh, social media, uh, sometimes with my fingers burnt, uh, perhaps uh, uh, mainly from disaffected patients uh, uh, who uh, voice complaints su uh, that suggest that there is a yawning gap between the patient's thirst for more explanation and the inadequate time and effort that programs invest in that preparatory education about what's coming. And that uh, involves not only dialysis and transplantation, but conservative care as well. I think the pro one of the big problems is the inability or uh, uh, failure of health professionals uh, to uh, get away from medical jargon. Uh, people talk uh, in uh, language that is not familiar to patients uh, or their families, and that is one of the great disconnects, I think, in the educative process that we run through as patients have declining kidney function. We need to make time, we need to take time, and we need to think about and dream up. I, I've always liked uh, simple analogies. For example, we don't talk about the glomerulus being uh, uh, a filtration process. We might talk about a coffee, a coffee pot and a coffee filter, things that are every day that people can relate to. And then they can look back and say, ah, I see what you're talking about when you're talking about uh, glomerular filtration. So we're going to use that sort of analogy as we pass through this. An awful lot of medical professionals use medical terminology. Simple words do far better. Why talk about renal, diaphoresis, cyanotic, uh, puritis, extremities, when you could talk about kidneys sweating, blue, itch, or toes and fingers? We need to use the words that patients understand. So let's not talk about uh, uh, diaphoresis. Just call it sweat, because we all do. So what's so hard about using the words that we were taught as kids and not those that were taught at medical school? I think we hide behind those words sometimes because we're too afraid that we uh, uh, to uh, come out of that box and talk in patient language. Th this is not of course true of all professionals or programs. There are many that offer I've said some here, but I'll, I'll go to many who offer excellent one-on-one -on -one and group dis uh, discussions and sessions. Many take their patients and their families on a careful journey uh, and are empathetic as they introduce dialysis. But the problem is many are not. Let's have a look briefly and say then what a good dialysis program might offer. How might it be structured and how what ways can, do they use and can we use to better ease patients and families uh, into and through what really is a rest of life uh, experience, whether it be dialysis, transplantation uh, or conservative therapy. Uh, these are always going to be rest of life. So this slide set that I'm going to go through now is, that's an introduction basically, and it's uh, uh, the slide set I use is, is my personal opinion. So um, not all people might agree with me and that some might think me off the mark. And if that's the case, well, uh, I'll wear that. Uh, but I'm going to now use the EGFR as an example of how we might teach patients and families in better, clearer, plainer language. In our renal unit, we have used the decline and the reduction in EGFR. And remember that EGFR is simply a mathematical way of representing uh, declining or kidney function. Uh, we use the EGFR as it declines to frame a system of guide points. 
what steps should be taken, when to take them, as kidney function is dwindling in the background. And that's the basic theme of this whole talk. So let me unpack the mysteries of kidney function as it declines and show you a discussion that I have with my patients. As I've just said, EGFR is a term that doctors use to express kidney function. It stands for estimated E, glomerular, they're the little filters in, in the kidney. There are about uh, somewhere between uh, a million and three million in most uh, Caucasian uh, uh, kidneys. Though interestingly, the Australian Aboriginal has as few as 300,000 in each kidney. And that may be one of the reasons why they are so prone to developing kidney disease. F stands for filtration and R, the rate at which that filtering process occurs. So it really comes down to the EGFR account amounts to the, or is the amount of kidney function that any person has. Perhaps serendipitously, that means by luck, a normal EGFR is 100 and means normal kidney function. An EGFR of zero means no kidney function. With uh, the normal kidney function, the filter is working and the filtration, the urine is full to the brim with wastes and uh, solutes and all the things that uh, are normally removed by normal kidney function. But when there is no kidney function, it's as though the filter is blocked. So when you add the water, nothing comes through. Uh, or if anything comes through, maybe a little bit of uh, water, but none of the coffee comes through. So uh, a, an EGFR of 100, remember, is normal. An EGFR of zero is zero. Forget all the units and the mil per minute stuff. We've, we uh, confuse people by adding these sorts of things and just think of a percentage scale from naught to 100. Or as EGFR declines, think of that in reverse from 100 down to zero. Just as the amount of filtered coffee gets less and less, as the filter begins to clog up, you can see nice clear filter, little bit uh, blocked up here, bit more there, and chocker block here, uh, uh, fully blocked. The amount that comes through will get less and less. So as the filtering system of the kidneys clog, the EGFR progressively falls from 100 towards zero, and the kidneys are able to filter less and less wastes. This is something we forget. I'm not, I'm not certainly not forgetting it now because as we age, our bits all age along with us. Our hair goes gray, our skin sags, we slow down. And most importantly, I find everything hurts when I get up first thing in the morning. It takes me a little bit of time to actually get my joints moving again as we go through the day. And, and this is a process called aging. We all go through that. I don't know why this is flicking about. Sorry about that. There is no reason to think that by some magic, our kidneys don't age too, because they do. We know that the hu human kidney function, EGFR, kidney function, human EGFR drops with age. We actually maintain a normal 100%, if you like, EGFR through to perhaps around about the age of 30. It can be the late 20s, can be the early 30s, but somewhere around the beginning of our fourth decade of life, our kidney function slowly begins to decline. And it falls in the normal person between about eight to 10 points each and every decade from around the age of 30. By the time we reach our 80s, most of us will quietly in the background have lost almost half of our original God-given kidney function. But this is normal. Well, if you assume that aging is normal, 
we have no cure for aging. We can't stop aging. Even Einstein wasn't able to alter his space time. But we have to realize that as we get older, we decline. Our EGFR, however, will never fall far enough to threaten our health or our natural lifespan. And darker clouds only begin to loom if kidney disease occurs on top of that natural aging loss, thus accelerating the rate of loss. Until if more than about two thirds, and this varies from individual to individual, it's not, ex you know, it's not like when you reach 33% uh, uh, EGFR, bang, you're in trouble. But as your kidney function gets down in towards that last uh, two third or last third of kidney function, uh, trouble begins to brew. Let's think about the following analogy. It'll show you how sooner or later, a decline of kidney function from kidney disease can lead to kidney failure. So let's imagine that your, uh, your kidneys or your, imagine a factory where you've got a hundred workers making a product. You've got a kidney with an EGFR of a hundred. Now let's say you fire 50 of those workers. You cut the workforce in half. You halve your EGFR from a hundred down to 50. The remaining workers, the remaining 50% of workers uh, will have to work a bit harder. Uh, they might do a bit of overtime. They might get home a bit later, but they'll manage, they'll cope. Indeed, some may even be happy to do some extra work as they will get more overtime pay. Indeed, this is what happens in, uh, uh, in the kidney situation. We call this functional upregulation. If you put a transplant in, for example, with somebody who's got zero uh, EGFR, when you provide them with an extra sing single kidney, you're effectively providing them with half of two. So their EGFR will be in the range of 50 to plus range, but there will be some upregulation in the function of that transplant, which will lead that transplant to function normally with an EGFR in excess of the 50 that the half of, kidney, of renal mass would suggest. The workers will cope. They'll sustain the factory output. There will be no major long-term disruption. Everything seems hunky-dory. But fire another half. Now things begin to unravel because there are too few workers left to do the work. The remaining workers will now be clearly overworked. They'll begin to leave, they'll jump ship, they'll fall ill, they'll just go somewhere else because they can't cope with the pace and the amount of work they're being asked to do. And of course, they won't be being replaced because who, who would want to come in and work in such a factory? There is no replacement available. You've reached a point of no return because the factory begins to fail as its workers quit, whether by choice or by death. A self-destructive pattern is established, a vicious cycle comes in, establishes factory implosion, uh, and the factory is doomed and guaranteed to be doomed. That's an analogy which I use with my patients to try and explain to them how kidney function uh, is declining and what, why suddenly when they get down to that, maybe a third of remaining kidney function, they enter a phase of, uh, of, of a vicious cycle of no return. And despite the fact that they're, uh, if, even if we could turn off their original kidney disease, they now have insufficient functioning uh, kidney uh, to sustain uh, 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 unchanged kidney function long term. As it, this is how it is with kidney disease. Regardless of the original reason for the work loss of worker nephrons, uh, kidney function will decline. So just like the failing factory as its workers are fired, as functioning nephrons are lost, uh, the EGFR will continue to dwindle and be lost and eventually kidney function will collapse. 
I would call that an inevitable self-fulfilling prophecy. So with kidney disease of any cause, once about two out of every three of the nephron workforce has been taken out. Now, it doesn't matter whether it's been taken out by uh, uh, diabetes, by uh, glomerular disease, by polycystic kidneys, by any form of kidney disease, Ultimately, what those kidney diseases do is they reduce your, your filtering workforce to the point where those that remain will be destined to eventually fail. So I'm leaving it for that at the, there, Dory, for just a minute. Uh, we might have a coffee break. If anybody's got a burning question, you might ask them if they want to ask it now. Otherwise, I'll give you about a minute or so uh, to take a breather and we'll go on. I know you're recording. Let's see. Can you hear me? You can hear me, right? Great. Now I can't hear you. Okay, wait a minute. <laughs> You just got muted. There. Right. That's yeah. fine. You are now unmuted again. Um, right. I can't, I can mute everybody at once, but I can't unmute everybody at once. So I okay. don't. Okay, we'll, we'll leave. I think people, people have had a break now. We'll just move on. Is that all right? Yes. Let me, yes. Everybody else is muted and we'll do, we'll take questions at the end. Like, like okay. our, we originally. There will be one more coffee break and I'll just give you a moment of silence during. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, time to move on. The next series of montage graphs, I hope, will show you how CKD evolves. Now, these can be a little complex. I'll try and take it slowly. Uh, and this is where the ability to replay these sessions uh, has some value, because if, you, if I lose you, you can always go back and have another go at it. Let's say that normally kidney function, EGFR, is sustained for, through the first three decades of life. So kidney function is going along at 100% uh, up until we will nominally say it's 30. It's not necessarily on the day you turn 30, but it's in that range. Then you start your age-related decline. It's probably not, in fact, a straight line, but a slowly curving down line, but I have represented this as a straight line for the purposes of this presentation. So let's say that from about the age of 30, kidney function begins to decline, remember, at about eight to 10 points per decade uh, ongoing. With a natural decline in EGFR, from the age of 30 to perhaps uh, following roughly this line over the next few decades of life. This of course will be entirely symptom free. Or if you have symptoms, those symptoms are not due to your ki declining kidney function. You may have symptoms that mimic those of kidney disease, but they will be due to something else. With normal age-related decline, perhaps about 50%, if you plot that out, by the time we reach 80, about half of our kidney function will have gone. Now, remember, when you're a transplant, you get one kidney, not two, so you're effectively getting half of your renal mass back. So uh, at the age of 80, uh, people with declining kidney function due to age are mimicking uh, a good functioning transplant who also is symptom free. Plenty is left for normal health. If you continue that dotted line out, we would have to live to be Methuselah to run out of kidney function. We'd run out of kidney function around the age of 130. Uh, and generally speaking, we don't live to 130. So everything is fine, even though kidney function is gently declining in the background. But how might this graph change if we overlie it with kidney disease? 
So here we are. Let's say that somebody starts, gets their kidney disease. They develop uh, IgA nephropathy, uh, a type of glomerulonephritis or, uh, or, or uh, inflammatory disease of the kidneys. And they develop that at about the age of uh, 20. Now, if it's relatively mild, the normal decline in kidney function would be going down around about here somewhere. Because they have got uh, an overlay of kidney disease, their kidney function will decline rather more rapidly. So they might reach their baseline out here somewhere. If their disease is more severe, uh, they will reach the baseline earlier. And if their disease is very severe, they'll clearly reach the, the baseline early. Now, the, the slope of these are just there uh, on the graph uh, for uh, as, as examples. Uh, I'm not necessarily saying that everybody who gets IgA disease at the age of 20 uh, will, uh, and it's mild, will run into trouble by the age of 80. Uh, you, I hope you understand that. Let's say, however, somebody gets the onset of kidney disease at 40. They've had maintained their normal kidney function out to around about the age of 30. Then they've started their normal age-related decline. And then suddenly they get kidney disease. The length of time it will take them with mild, moderate and severe disease to reach a baseline, the end, if you like, of their kidney function, will be much longer. So the older you are when you have the onset of kidney disease of the same degree, it will take you longer to reach the baseline. Now, symptoms, uh, for most people, symptoms are rare in kidney disease with an EGFR greater than about 25, maybe 30, 25 is where we usually uh, put that. Uh, but the disease severity and age of onset determine when the baseline is going to be reached. So the more severe the disease, the faster you're going to lose kidney function and the quicker you reach both symptoms and later on uh, an end stage kidney disease baseline. So there are no symptoms up until the, or before the EGFR drops, certainly into the 20s. And if you have got symptoms in that time, we really need to start to think carefully about whether there are other reasons why you are feeling as you are. Because kidney function itself rarely explains significant symptoms until the EGFR is, we'll say 25 to 30 or less. I've used the term 25. Minor symptoms will begin for uh, uh, some, perhaps most, once the EGFR drops below 25, and many of those symptoms relate to the slow onset of the anemia of chronic kidney disease. But we'll talk about anemia and kidney disease in another session at a later time. Obviously, more prominent symptoms appear once you're down below about 20 uh, an EGFR of 20. And by the time you reach an EGFR, usually less than 10. Uh, uh, in Australia, the mean is somewhere between seven and eight. That is when dialysis generally uh, is started for most. Though we have had uh, particularly elderly patients who are extremely well, even though their GFR is down in the five to six range. These graphs show that as CKD progresses at different rates, the EGFR will reach the baseline at different time points. And this will depend upon the age of onset and the severity of the disease hit. Kidney disease is largely symptom free until the uh, level of kidney function is really quite low. And symptoms prior to that may be due to other reasons. And certainly here, although this is not entirely true, we're very different in the way we approach the start of dialysis here in Australia. We don't normally start dialysis in most people until the EGFR is down in this kind of range. Though in the United States, uh, it has been um, uh, often common practice to start uh, once the EGFR is in the 12 to 15 range. Uh, we believe that that's both unnecessary and too early. Uh, and simply replaces 
uh, moderate symptoms of end-stage kidney failure uh, with uh, the rigors uh, and risks of dialysis. So we don't start dialysis till we have to. Even then, there's a lot that can be done to uh, help your struggling workforce of, uh, uh, of filtration, keeping it afloat. And this is the realm of good CKD management. So while ultimate functional loss may not be averted, it can be delayed or, and or, made much more tolerable. Remembering that the EGFR diminishes as we get older, so an elderly person with a low GFR without other overt symptoms of kidney disease is not really at major risk. Their reserve is less. So if an older person, uh, 70 or 80, who's already got an EGFR down in the uh, 50 to 60 range, then gets uh, additional renal disease, they, they're starting off at a lower baseline. And so they have less reserve to play with. Now I'm gonna have another break at this point while I have a sip of my uh, dry ginger ale. And you stand and stretch or yawn uh, or leave the session cause you're bored stiff uh, or feed the cat. Nobody's left yet. My, right, well, cat, we'll my cat is crying outside the door and I can't get up and, and, and see to her because the computer is on my lap, so. Well, I've got uh, Rosie and Yogi are patrolling the balcony for parrots like uh, uh, two armed police. Um, anyhow. Um, can I, I just, Fez, ha, Fez does have a question. He is wondering um, if he has a transplant. I think he just said he just got a transplant. Should he yes. be expecting or aiming for a GFR of 50? Um, most uh, prop fully functioning good normal transplants um, will attain an EGFR of, of 50, off, often up to 60 and sometimes above. Uh, the fact that he, if he's got an EGFR of 45, uh, that will depend on a whole lot of things. He's a man. Uh, let's say he got a female kidney. Uh, I don't know. But let's say he got a female kidney. Female kidneys are generally smaller than male kidneys. Hmm. So if you put a female kidney into a male recipient, that will tend to run at a slightly higher creatinine and lower EGFR than if you had replaced uh, that male person's kidney function with a male kidney. Now, there are all sorts of things that impact uh, uh, the, the, uh, um, the eventual EGFR that a transplant might run at. Certainly if you've had any evidence uh, or episodes of rejection, that may impact. Sometimes a, a few points of EGFR will be uh, uh, whittled away if the kidney has had a lot, what's called a long ischemia time. That means that between being removed from the donor uh, and implanted, it, there is a long period of a longer than normal period of time between removal and implantation. And sometimes there may be imported disease. That means that uh, particularly if you're getting a person's kidney uh, and the donor is 60, 70 or above, remember that that donor's kidney function has been declining uh, in, the, uh, in the background from their normal age related decline. So you're not getting a kidney which uh, has um, particular, a completely normal uh, EGFR in the first place. So you may be starting at a lower baseline. So I don't know whether that answers his question, but uh, there are, and th they are just a few of the things that will impact the eventual EGFR that an implanted kidney in transplantation might attain. Does that, uh, just to ask him yeah, if that what, answers the what, question. What would a good cold ischemic time for a um, deceased donor kidney be? Is there an ideal? 
Well, uh, we don't, obviously the shorter the period, uh, the better, but uh, in this day and age, when you're flying kidneys from one side of the United States to the other, or from one side of Australia to the other, you've got flyby time, you've got all sorts of waiting time for a commercial flight, all that sort of stuff. So we would, we would like to see under 12 hours and certainly under 15 and getting on beyond about 15 hours cold ischemia time is, uh, is beginning to push the envelope. Uh, but that's just an off-the-cuff answer to the question. Thank you. Right, so let's move on. So by the age of 80, most of us will have lost half our kidney function. Uh, I think we've got that point. But we also, as we get older, we tend to eat less, we do less, we actually generate less waste. So as we age, we actually don't quite need the EGFR that we did when we were uh, playing uh, uh, football as an, uh, as an 18 or 20 year old, when we were active and young. When we're active and young and we're eating lots of protein and we're, uh, uh, we're going to the gym every day and we're exercising, and we're rushing around like a bee in a bottle, we actually generate more stuff. So as we get older, stuff lessens. So an 80 year old with an EGFR of 30 plus and with no other markers of active kidney disease is actually not at any significant risk. So we don't get our knickers in a knot over uh, uh, what appears to be a relatively low EGFR and an otherwise well 80 year old. Sadly, unfortunately, lots of elderly people have the living daylight scared out of them and often unnecessarily by being told they have kidney failure. We have patients who are 84, 84 or 85 referred in by their general practitioner or what do you call them, primary care physicians or whatever, uh, where they've been told they've got kidney failure because their EGFR is um, 32. Uh, that's wrong, uh, particularly if they're well and they have no active significant major evidence of, of kidney disease, we, would, we tend to try and uh, uh, trumpify them, we downplay uh, the evidence of their kidney disease. In truth, most of those patients have appropriately aged kidneys and are really in no danger at all. And as well as that, because of what I said earlier, because you don't need as much EGFR or kidney function when you're older, older people tolerate lower EGFRs, often very low, without too much trouble. So frightening the living daylights out of them is not a particularly nice or sensible thing to do. We spook far too many patients when indeed what we need to do is reassure them that likely, not always, but likely they will be fine. We, if we pull gentle, low key medical levers and uh, carefully observe them, make sure that they're not going off uh, faster than we had expected, uh, that we monitor their blood pressure, we manage that with the appropriate and correct drugs, we do a creatinine, a creatinine check from time to time, and not too frequently. Uh, you can plot somebody's creatinine rise, or if you like, EGFR fall, because they go in uh, uh, opposite directions. And if the rate is as you expect, it tends to stay at that rate and not accelerate. If we make attention to lifestyle and good management of general health and diet, the data would show us that people over the age of 80, particularly those with other without, uh, uh, sorry, uh, with other significant comorbidities are generally not benefited by dialysis. So we tend to uh, attempt this sort of management rather than rush in with dialysis because the evidence for people over the age of 80 with uh, particularly if they've got attendant heart disease uh, would tell us that they are no, they will not live longer with dialysis, but they will live worse. And so we need to be cautious about uh, particularly in the elderly rushing in where fools uh, uh, fear to tread. In those where CKD is advancing and renal replacement therapy is planned, then we can start to use the EGFR in a different, wiser way. So let's talk briefly for the last bit of uh, this talk 
on uh, the EGFR as a, a guidance tool of what to do and when to do it. The EGFR is often poorly used in deep CKD. Unfortunately, far too many, and these are dialysis professionals, still seem to use the EGFR as the starting gate for dialysis. In other words, you reach an EGFR of 15, bang, you need dialysis. That's patently wrong uh, and unnecessary uh, and uh, I would say meddlesome. In my view, the EGFR is more useful if it is used as a marker of when to start doing stuff if or as the CKD, uh, CKD is advancing, EGFR is falling. By using the EGFR as a step marker, we need to interpret that against the rate of decline. So how fast is it going? To, how fast are you losing kidney function? Obviously, if you're losing kidney function nice and gently and slowly, then we can also be more relaxed in the approach we take to getting that patient ready for what might be coming. If on the other hand, the EGFR is going down hand over fist at a rapid rate, uh, then clearly we need to um, uh, step in uh, quicker and more actively. So these things matter. The other thing, another thing that matters is the chronophysiological age of the patient. That's a very complex term. Chrono means time and physiology means uh, how the body is working. So that means that we can have an 80 year old, you know perfectly well, you can list off among your friends uh, you've got an 85-year-old uh, uh, friend who is fit as a trout, mined like a steel trap, uh, runs marathons. In other words, they might be old, but they are physiologically young. On the other hand, there may be people who are 50 who ha have, had a, have done themselves hard and are physiologically 80. So we need to understand the difference and not just go on a person's uh, number of years on the clock, but how those years have affected how that person's uh, functioning uh, uh, is. We also need to uh, uh, know whether the patient has an intent to dialyze or, or we have an intent to offer dialysis or whether pursuit of conservative care might be appropriate. And there are a lot of other factors which I won't go into. But when I talk about the intent to dialyze, I have patients who uh, often they come from the farm. Uh, it's interesting, the farmer has a, a very different um, I, uh, take on life. I guess over uh, his 50 years on the farm, he's been putting down animals, uh, he's used to death, he's used to the end of life, uh, because that is what a, a farmer sees year on, year out amongst his uh, crops and also amongst his animals. So they have a slightly different idea and they come in and they say, look, I've lived my four score years and uh, I don't want to do, I don't want to end up attached to a machine for the last few years of my life. We need to listen to our patients and not necessarily impose a therapy that they may not want to have. So these are the sorts of things that come into the uh, use of the EGFR as a step marker. In our renal service, however, bells do start ringing once the EGFR is 30 or less. Our ears prick up and we think, hmm, what are we going to, what's going to be best for this patient? We start the discussion with them and their family. In a patient whose EGFR is 30, where eventually dialysis and transplantation is intended, we just begin to gently acquaint them with the fact that yes, kidney function is declining and it may not last you as long as you want to last, even if that's a long way off. We don't get too uh, into heavy discussion, but we begin to sow the seed that we need to think about, you need to think about 
uh, we need to jointly think about uh, how we're going to approach this if over time your kidney function declines uh, before you're ready uh, to uh, uh, hand in your chips. Once the EGFR is down at 25, we need to begin to plan directions of care. We need to start to think about uh, transplantation, particularly. Uh, not everybody is going to be suited to transplantation, whether that is a combination of age or pre-existing uh, other uh, comorbidities, other problems, other things wrong with them. Uh, but if transplantation is likely to be uh, in their stars, then we need to start to talk to the patient about is there a, a, a live donor that we might be able to move towards preemptive transplantation? Because in Australia now, 40% of our transplants are at live donor preemptive transplantation, which means the patient never gets to see a dialysis machine, and that's the way it should be. Uh, we open the batting around the paired kidney exchange. I know you have one of these in the States. We have one here, which is where um, uh, a, a, a related or, or friend donor doesn't match the recipient, but uh, somebody else somewhere in the country does. And so we can arrange cross transplantation. And of course, if none of that is available, we need to talk and think about uh, deceased donor transplantation uh, once the patient has entered the dialysis program. But if, the, if dialysis is, is uh, uh, likely at some point in time, either because there is no donor uh, or because the patient may not be transplant suited for whatever reason, then we need to think about all the various forms of uh, dialysis, home dialysis, PD, home hemo, nocturnal, satellite nocturnal, shared care hemodialysis, and as a last resort, as a last resort, facility-based conventional hemodialysis. This is, has to be a fallback position, not the preferred uh, direction. Home dialysis in this country is uh, always front of mind, front of room, front and center, the thing we aim for. And we begin to uh, discuss that possibility early when the EGFR is 25, but the writing is clearly on the wall that this patient will at some point in, in the future uh, come to dialysis. Obviously, uh, both uh, can it be appropriate uh, for some people. And as I've talked before, and I'm not gonna go back through that again, conservative care where appropriate. At this point, we invite all patients and their families to a full education day. We provide them with uh, uh, lunch. Uh, we hold these uh, two or three times a year. And at these education uh, 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 form formats, we in gently introduce all treatment options. We present the choices, again, home, hemo home dialysis, whether PD, hemo or both, are front and center of uh, our, our presentation and are always presented as the best option with the most optimum outcomes. We believe facility care is only a fallback option. We of course present the choices of transplantation. We talk about live donors, we talk about uh, uh, um, uh, paired kidney exchange, all of that sort of stuff. And we have a separate uh, education session for patients who are likely transplant recipients. I'm not going to dwell on this, stay on this uh, 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 slide uh, in terms of uh, uh, the um, paired uh, kidney exchange, but we talk about this at around the EGFRs of 2025. Donor and recipient workups begin uh, when uh, EGFR is around 18. So this is where we start to check that the recipient has got two kidneys and they're functioning normally and that there are no uh, contraindications to that recipient as a donor uh, and that they pair nicely with their recipient and so on. Uh, and at this stage, EGFR around about 18, we would make sure that the transplant physician and surgeon assessments are done to ensure that all individual requirements are met. 
And of course, for all, we talk about care directives and enduring powers of attorney uh, at those education meetings. And they go away with a little show bag full of the, uh, all the information that we have shared with them, including copies of the slides that we use uh, uh, in our presentations. At those sessions, uh, uh, short talks are given by uh, a group of people, uh, particularly the home training staff, but the real stars of our day are our home patients. And we, get a, we don't use centre-based patients to talk about dialysis. Why would you do that? I mean, that, that's uh, patently stupid because you're actually then uh, uh, sucking those, uh, your, your uh, in, intended patients into the vortex that is uh, uh, um, uh, in centre uh, uh, care. Our patient stories, uh, those, uh, these are our home patients, always receive the most engagement, the most interactivity, the most interest and the greater positivity. We pick, we pick and our patients pick uh, uh, us uh, well uh, so that uh, uh, they are matched to the audience. Uh, and our home patient speakers get a huge buzz from their contribution. And this gives our patients to be the benefit of proper, learned, lived in experience. Most subsequent education is then one on one with our dialysis and transplant educator. We have a full time uh, person in our unit whose role it is uh, to uh, uh, add to anything that the nephrologists have glossed over or where they've used inappropriate language so that the patients don't understand what they're talking about. Uh, and there are one on one uh, education. Uh, sessions with our home training teams, both hemodialysis and PD. Our education is intentionally drip fed. We don't try not to give too much information at any one time uh, and give it in bite sized bits to avoid information overload and overpowering. There, there are se several subsequent educator visits needed, uh, often for two or more hours at a time, uh, at the patient's chosen pace, with family present, always with family present. You can even bring the family dog if you want to do that. It's, a, it's an interactive process with all the people that matter in that person's life. Uh, with the uh, information now focusing uh, down onto the therapy that has that seems to be the most likely uh, first point of entry for that patient. Once the EGFR is 20, it's time we get our access ducts in a row for hemodialysis. We get vein mapping and referral to our access uh, multi uh, 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 group uh, uh, access clinic for surgical assessment and listing. Uh, in Australia, we use um, uh, conventional uh, uh, vein, artery to vein access. We don't use grafts uh, and uh, we rarely use catheters except to get out of trouble uh, while an access is being revised. Our goal is AV, AV access in place and maturing when the EGFR is around 15 to 18, leaving time for it to be superficialized if needed. Although this presentation is directly uh, a directed primary at hemodialysis, PD is a key home therapy, uh, and in many jurisdictions, uh, PD first is an overarching principle. So by EGFR of 20, we'll have had a frank uh, discussion about uh, whatever uh, dial home dialysis is going to be uh, chosen uh, or chosen by the patient and chosen for the patient in a cooperative dual discussion format. Uh, and PD assessment needs inclusion of things like assessing for hernias and past abdominal uh, surgery and uh, whether the patient has the physical capacity to do home, di home peritoneal dialysis or whether dexterity, vision and cognitive impairment might prove an issue. At this point, we also show our patients and families the machines they need to master. Uh, they touch and feel and size them, and we encourage them 
to spend time with home hemodialysis patients and home peritoneal dialysis patients who've already mastered them. And we set those times up uh, and we put them in non-challenging situations uh, so they can just sit down without us in the room. So they sit there and they ask a fellow patient, okay, they've told me this, are they telling me the truth? Discussed and solved by this stage should be storage, floor, floor strength, plumbing needs, travel, holiday, all of that stuff needs to be uh, uh, sorted through such that by an EGFR of 12 to 15, all the ducks are in a row. Everything has been done. That doesn't mean to say that is when you start dialysis. Absolutely not. But you need to be ready by that stage so that when dialysis does come along, we're not scrambling around to do stuff that the patient is unfamiliar with. So all the boxes should be ticked and all the checklists finished. I'm not going to deal with crash landers, but clearly you know that there are people who present late uh, from the community. Uh, either via acute on chronic kidney failure or uh, uh, people who are ostriches, people who despite uh, all the fair efforts to warn and educate them, they stick their heads in the sand and ignore uh, either through fear or neglect or particularly with the young, have a mistaken belief that they're bulletproof and everything that the doctors are telling me won't happen to me. An effective program needs to be balanced, structured, have a committed staff, be empathetic, compassionate, understanding, and above all, have patience. Because patients have patience. Because patients, and I probably shouldn't use the word patient, I know that offends some people, but I've used that all the way through because I'm a doctor and I can't get out of that habit. Uh, each patient assimilates information at a different rate. We need to understand that different styles of education are needed for different folks. So we have to have our teaching programs for home dialysis structured into read, hear or do, because some people prefer to read, some prefer to hear and some prefer to do, or a combination of all three. So good education actually doesn't require an adaptable patient. It requires adaptable staff. And I think that's a message we, we really hone down on in our unit, that it is the staff that must adapt and not the patient. I mean, despite all of this, some patients, uh, some staff will fail uh, some patients. And we must be prepared for uh, fair criticism uh, and uh, fair criticism should be given uh, and taken in good faith. We're coming to the end now and you've probably had enough. We've almost done an hour. Uh, to recap, using the EGFR to guide renal replacement preparation, EGFR 30, begin non-threatening discussion of preferences. EGFR of 25, firm up plans, expected treatment route, invite family and friends to group education, discuss care directives and powers of attorney, begin one-on-one -on -one educational reinforcement and explore home installation issues, which includes home visitation. EGF, EGFR of 20, donor recipient workup and transplant team referral, access assessment, surgical review, book theater lists, and home visit by the home training team to scope any installation issues. EGFR of 12 to 15, complete the checklist, review unaddressed concerns or uncertainties. EGFR of eight to 10, increase the visit of frequency uh, and be prepared to call time so that in conclusion, in advanced or advancing CKD, we think the EGFR is best considered as a tool and not a threat. 
I think you hope you understand from what I've been saying throughout all of this uh, uh, that the EGFR is a, is a means to an end and it's not in itself uh, the uh, baseball bat that you're going to hit the patient over the head with. The EGFR should not be used as a number by which to call time for dialysis, but as a guide to prop the preparatory steps towards it. As the elderly tolerate very low EGFR very well and for a very long time without major symptoms, perhaps beyond EPO and iron manageable anemia, consideration for conservative care should always be given uh, as a strongly considered option. And so I'm going to leave it at that, Dory. Um, uh, I've rambled through a lot of stuff there. Uh, I hope I haven't left too many uh, behind, and I hope Stephen in, uh, uh, and Fez in the UK, because it's probably about one in the morning there, uh, are not snoring, uh, but I'll take any questions that might come. Thank you. All right, uh, I'm going to start with a couple of questions that came across by um, by the chat, and let's see if I can change my view here now so we can see. Right, right. I've got you back online. Yeah, good. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so here we are, a bunch of us, and uh, David. Uh, I'm going. Uh, Sherry actually asked a question first, but hers is much more more um, involved. So I'm going to ask David's question first because. That was quick and to the point and very relevant to your topic. And that was, um, what exactly is the importance of, um, of uh, African-American race in the EGFR formula? And uh, there was sort of an add-on question from Fez about you know, why aren't other nationalities included separately? So I wondered if you wanted to delve into that formula a little bit. Um, sort of. Uh, uh, you've got to remember that I live on the far side of the planet where people hang on with their fingernails and walk upside down. Uh, and I so, <laughs> uh, so I, I don't really have um, much uh, experience, let's say, with uh, African Americans here. We have our own Aboriginal population. Uh, I don't know that... Uh, I, I don't know the data on the African-American glomerular population. And what I mean by that is that uh, if you read a textbook, and, and it's probably going to be a long answer to a, uh, a simple question, but if you read um, uh, many of the textbooks, uh, you'll see that uh, each kidney has a million glomeruli. Uh, that's a glomerulus is a little filter or uh, each glomerulus feeds a nephron. So if you like, each kidney has uh, about a million uh, filter units, either as glomerul glomer the filtering uh, uh, nodule or the tubular structure that together make up a nephron. So that means the average, uh, 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 what we call Caucasians, which are, are white, uh, the, the, the European white population, uh, have around about a million uh, uh, glomeruli or nephrons per kidney. But we now know that's patently wrong. And that's not in fact true. Uh, that the range of, gl of, of glomerular number or nephron number is actually quite wide, even within the European based uh, 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 population. If you take the Australian Aboriginal, uh, the number of nephrons per uh, uh, per kidney is as low as 300,000, uh, often between 300,000 and 600,000. So if you, and, and we know that the, uh, the, the white population, the European based population, a million is an, under, is an underscore number. It's more like uh, one and a half million, if you like. So if you say take both kidneys, you've got one and a half million in one kidney, you've got one and a half million in the other, you've got three million nephrons all over. You take the Australian Aboriginal who's got maybe half a million, that's a median number for the Australian Aboriginal. That means that their total nephron population is one million, 500 in one kidney, 500 in the other, assuming both kidneys are roughly equal. So the Australian Aboriginal has one third of the filter um, uh, number N for their filters, that a, a comparable uh, European white 
in Australia would have. Then hit that with disease. So you're adding disease on top of a much lower number of available filters or nephrons. And that means that you lose those, uh, a, 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 the same hit of IgA disease, the same hit of uh, diabetes will do much more damage to somebody who's only got a total in two kidneys of a million glomeruli versus a person who's got a total in their two kidneys of three million glomeruli. So the same hit induces a far greater disease. And that's one, and why has the Australian Aboriginal only got 500 or there, well, using, I'm using that loosely, but 500,000 uh, glomeruli in each kidney. It's a combination of, uh, of, of teleology, uh, of, uh, um, of circumstance until we came along 200 years ago and stuffed them up completely. Uh, they uh, were happy in their desert. They uh, ate um, uh, a desert uh, uh, diet. Uh, they didn't have uh, the influence of sugars and other things that we have introduced that now wipe out their kidney function uh, at a far greater rate so that the Australian Aboriginal has 20 times the rate of kidney disease and decline in kidney function of any other population on the planet. Now, I don't know the data for the, uh, coming back to your question about no, uh, the uh, African-Americans, I don't know what their developmental uh, uh, data is, how many glomeruli they have, uh, their susceptibility, of course, to hypertension and various other uh, uh, things that are uh, uh, in the African-American, maybe three or 400 years uh, in the development, whereas in the Australian Aboriginal, it's only 200 years in development. But these are the sorts of things that might impact upon uh, an EGFR. I don't know the number, for example, uh, whether the African American has the same uh, glomerular population as uh, a white uh, European uh, uh, American. These are the sorts of things that maybe in future we'll tease out but at the moment, I don't have an answer for. David, I'm not sure whether that answered your question, but they're the sorts of things we ought well, to be thinking it about. Does it, it does and it doesn't. And what, what I'm always curious about is when I get my blood labs back, I get two values. I get a value for non-African and I get a, a value for African. I saw, I have seen a recent paper on that where somebody has, uh, and I can't remember where I saw it, it was in the last six to 12 months, where uh, that actually is being, I think, uh, uh, corrected, uh, and where uh, there is an intent in the United States to remove that uh, difference, because there's actually some data that suggests that that difference does not exist. Wow. Now, uh, I can't remember where the paper was, but it was it was a prestigious uh, paper. I think it was at C. Jason, but uh, it was certainly in the last six to twelve months uh, where I think there is a, uh, uh, as I say, an intent to uh, remove that difference uh, in laboratory values. But we don't have that same uh, reporting difference here. Well, I was also going to point out that the the reason that being um, a, a premature baby increases the risk of kidney disease. Low birth weight, low birth weight uh, low is one weight, of the right. uh, key Not as many uh, determinants in the, in the Australian Aboriginal, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, low birth weight babies have less numbers of glomeruli, and that may right. be a major feeder uh, into uh, the difference that we see here. I don't know the data on birth weights and so on uh, in the United States between, for example, uh, an African-American or a non-African-American. There's a range of, of things that are likely contributors here that um, uh, need to be uh, sorted out. So if I'm getting two figures, which do I believe? 
Uh, I can't answer that question not being familiar with the sorts of figures you get. Oh, you, you. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not dodging the, the question. I just don't know the answer because when I'm not in a situation where uh, that's something that I would think about. Sorry. Um, all right, I'm gonna I'm going to paraphrase Sher Sherry's question and then um, I will let her unmute. I, Sherry, I don't want to have you tell you the entire long story. Or we'll be here all night long, so. You can correct me if I am mis misstating this, but Sherry's mom is 83 and she did PD and now she's in center. She's very exhausted. She's not feeling well after each treatment. Um, she would like her dad to contemplate doing home hemo with her mom, but he hasn't been told by the medical team that she will feel better if she does so. And she wants somebody with authority to say, yes, she will feel better if she tries this and you get to be the authority having never Actually, met. Actually, it's not looking for authority. It's asking the question. Okay. She's, yeah. So it's asking the question, would home hemo likely or possibly make a significant difference? She's, she's dealing with just daily constant high level of fatigue. Um, there's not a, co, a coexisting thing. She has high blood pressure, but there's nothing coexisting that's creating it, and some cognitive decline from the, the fatigue. Um, I, I, I hate to say it, but she's 80 plus. Yes. Uh, and, and that is her major problem. That is what yeah. I said as well. Uh, it, it's, dialysis does not um, return you to normal kidney function. It doesn't matter whether it's PD or hemodialysis or anything else. Uh, it doesn't magically turn back the clock uh, to say that you're now 82 or whatever age she is with completely normal kidney function. So replacing PD with hemo, she may uh, she's jump not doing, She's not doing PD. She's doing in-center three times, two times a week now, but it was yeah. three times a week. They did try a slower rate, um, but they moved the rate back up because that wasn't making a difference and it wasn't I, I don't remember if it was affecting the clearance, but she's not, she doesn't have water. She doesn't have water coming off. And my father tried to do the training. He was able to needle successfully and comfortably, but he just saw how many bells and whistles and how much work it was. And he says he doesn't want to consider it unless it makes a big difference, unless it could make a difference in her well being. I, I have to say, my guess is it won't. Uh, and, and, you know, I can only say what I honestly think. Uh, yeah. I, I rather fancy uh, it's not because I would think that uh, whatever you uh, dialysis process you do uh, in somebody who is 80 plus, uh, there is age uh, and uh, just the imposition of all of this. Uh, and uh, you have to also say how much of that might be just depression and the fact that she, depression is the wrong word. Um, yeah. uh, but just uh, what's it all, why am I doing, what's it all about? Why am I doing this? Um, uh, it's not necessarily the physical. Uh, no, this, this, is, this is physiological. I mean, we've looked at the emotional too, but this is physiological. She is just plain. She, gets, she just can't do very much before she needs a nap. Yeah, I rather fancy the answer uh, uh, might be no, uh, that it's not going to make that much difference, uh, that your father's going to have to go through an awful lot of training and worry and concern for him, uh, and the imposition on him may be more than the benefit for her. I'm uh, going to ask so, you uh, one uh, oh. We have patients in their 80s on home dialysis, absolutely. Uh, that's not, I'm not saying that people who are elderly can't do home dialysis. They absolutely can. Uh, uh, but in your, in this circumstance, uh, what I'm kind of hearing is I'm not sure it's going to make that much difference, but uh, I don't know your mum and dad and I, you know, I'm the other side of the world and I don't know all of the, uh, I mean, uh, what's, what's her anemia status. I mean, we have a very different approach, for example, here, uh, to the management of anemia than uh, you do in the United States. Uh, we, we don't understand why you can allow somebody to have to be anemic on dialysis. Uh, why don't they have a normal hemoglobin? Uh, 
uh, why don't you use appropriate iron and EPO and other uh, uh, mechanisms to, to dial a, 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 a haemoglobin that they can live comfortably with? Uh, if she's running a haemoglobin of, of, I don't know whether you use 10 or 100. Um, 10. 10? Okay. Uh, uh, depends on the number of whether you're grams per decilitre yeah. or grams per litre. Uh, if you're running a haemoglobin of 10, uh, you're never going to feel good. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, some, not. Yeah, there is some anemia, and I want to listen to your anemia lecture when you do it. Um, uh, so, well, I'm not sure I'm going to. We talked about this with Dory the other day. I'm not sure I'm uh, how much I'm going to get into anemia because our approach to anemia here is so different to yours that anything, anything I say will just get you all rolled up and 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 and, and, and upset. But I can't change the U.S. process. Uh, but we uh, believe. Uh, I believe and we believe uh, broadly in this country that uh, uh, I'm not sure there's a God, but if, if there is a God and he gave you a haemoglobin, uh, which was meant to be 125 or 130, uh, what's wrong with that? Yeah. So we shoot for a haemoglobin of 120 to 125. Uh, that's, uh, 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 and anything less than that, you're anemic and you will be symptomatic from that anemia. Let me ask one, one, well, I, I, one, I'm not, I don't want to go into that in any great detail, but one, uh, one follow up question, would they be able to simulate and test whether home hemo would make the difference by arranging with the center to go four times at a slower rate um, on the regular machine. Um, they, that would help. Um, Logistically. Uh, really challenging to do that. It, it is. I don't think you're going to find a center in the world who is going to be able to yeah. suddenly turn yeah. around and offer uh, one patient in that center four or even five uh, treatments in center a week. Uh, it just doesn't... I'm, uh, I'm talking about for five weeks to see if it makes a difference and if it does, so if it, it throws a wrench struggling. in the in-center schedule. You oh, can't okay. just give somebody because you're, that means that the that's two normally chairs. Normally in that, sh exactly. Yeah. Normally in that chair, if, if you, Somebody if you else. add okay. one more treatment, that means you take away two other treatments that week for some other person. Okay. It, 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 unless there is a program in place, a transitional care unit, for example, that is set up to do that for four or five weeks, and that's what they are. There aren't that many of those yet. They're new and they're growing. We have the ability to do that because we do transitional care. Exactly. So in that circumstance, we can just throw an just extra treatment. That, uh, whip your mum into our home training program mm -hmm. uh, for four weeks and see if it made any difference. But most place, places in the States don't have that uh, uh, flexibility. Right. Uh, and non, oh, I, I'm almost prepared to say none, uh, close to none. Close to none. Mayo that, does in center short short daily, and I think um, either Duke or Wake Forest. I can't remember or both, but they're about it. We don't and list it. Uh, uh, it Cam uh, uh, um, in LA who can do that sort of stuff as well, but there are very few people around uh, who can offer that sort of uh, intense dialysis as an in as any form of in center care. Um, anyway. All right. So how, uh, how are you doing that as best I can. Do you want to take any other questions if anyone else has one? Yeah. I okay. mean, I, I've got so nothing to do except that, go down to sleep for a cup of coffee. Because we don't want to have 15 people. We have 15 now. We had 16. So we had 16 people for almost the whole time, which is great. Um, we don't want everybody talking at once. So if you have a question and your camera's on, just raise your hand, wave your hand, and then, you know, unmute yourself. And, and you can ask a question. If you don't have a camera on, use the text if you have a question. And I can repeat your question or you can unmute yourself and ask your question. I've stopped talking now, that means it's your turn. Fez? You need to unmute Fez. Yep. Let's see if I can invite him. To um, there. Mine's already written anyway. Um, it's not really GFR related. Um, so the first bit is more home hemo related. Um, so I was reading up on stuff like 
the new quantum machine that may be out in some countries, but I believe it's coming out in the UK soon. Um, do you think machines like the Quanta SC Plus will encourage more home hemo rather than like the big ones behind me? Uh, absolutely. I'm, I'm actually, I have to confess, I'm uh, uh, on their medical advisory board. Uh, okay. I've been on the medical advisory board for Qantas since uh, 2015. Uh, so I'm uh, intimately uh, aware of the developments of and the progress of Quanta. Um, uh, yes, I do believe it will uh, encourage home hemodialysis. The Quanta, however, has uh, the same Achilles heel that all current uh, available dialysis systems have, and that is its ability to travel. So as a home machine, I think it, it is, I, I hate to say this, um, uh, you know, I've got to be very careful about the way I, I put this. Uh, I, I think it offers better dialysis than other uh, small home machines. <laughs> better than the next stage, basically. I didn't say that. I said it. On your view. <laughs> so, um, uh, my... I, I think it does offer uh, significantly better dialysis because it actually is, um, it's a single pass system in a small body. Uh, okay. And for that purpose, uh, it is, uh, I think, a, a far preferable machine. But it also uh, requires an RO, the same yeah. way as any other. Um, uh, single pass system does. And until you have a portable RO that you can put in the boot or take with you in the, uh, uh, um, uh, in an aeroplane, uh, you're limited in terms of the ability to travel. Now, uh, I, I don't want to um, jump the gun on this, but there, there are developments in progress, right, uh, that might help correct that. Uh, that's the best I can say. Uh, but at the moment, uh, unless you have an RO at your point of, um, uh, 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 of destination, uh, then you can, you can certainly pick up your quantum machine and, and put it in the trunk of the car or take it in the aeroplane. Uh, it's slightly lighter and smaller than the, uh, than the uh, next stage. Uh, and it provides better dialysis. I, I'm absolutely uh, uh, dead certain of that. Uh, but you don't have the, the portability that every dialysis patient at home wishes and hopes that they will have. Yeah. Now, um, in the future, uh, I, I think the Quanta will have uh, greater advantages, but that's its Achilles heel for now. Okay, cool. And my other thing was related to the young people or young adults who apparently stick their heads in the sand. Um, I think part of it might be because they think they're bulletproof, but I also think the way information is given to them has not been adapted in a way that they would relate to, and it's just given in the same way it would be given to um general age groups that tend to have kidney illnesses so like the older generations for example and that is an aspect that makes them switch off um so i think that needs adapting and maybe not as many young adults or young people um would stick their hand uh, head in the sand so to speak so i think it they do to an extent but i think they do it because of a reason uh, i just wanted to clarify that I take your point on that. I, I, I don't have a ready answer for it, uh, but I hear what you're saying. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Steve. Looking very comfortable there, Steve. Super comfortable. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, to, to kind of back that up with my own experience. I was diagnosed in my uh, late 20s with IGA and was on a wait and watch policy that, that having just listened to your lecture is, is obvious why. But as nothing seemed to happen to me for over a decade, I was really, really complacent about what was going to happen and all the doom and gloom 
that I was being fed, which is what it seemed like to me by my, my nephrologist, it, it just seemed an irrelevant other world. Uh, and, and as a result, I kind of uh, lost contact with my renal team uh, and then ended up crash landing in, needing dialysis, because I'd, I'd been uh, absent from the system for a couple of years. Uh, and the couple of years where all of that education that you've just talked about should have been taking place. I mean, I think that's right. Um, uh, what I tried to uh, impart through that talk, and, and you're picking up on that, is, is the fact that nothing happens. Yeah. Uh, that you stay essentially a, uh, free of, of, of symptoms until your kidney function is relatively low. Uh, and even then, the symptoms are not... Um, uh, there's no pain. There's no, you know, oh, I don't have pain, doctor. Therefore, I can't, there can't be anything wrong. Uh, I feel a bit tired, but perhaps I just need a, a, a pickup or a, some vitamin pills or whatever it is. Uh, the, the symptoms of chronic kidney disease take year, in, in the majority of patients, take years, even decades of this decline, slow decline, where nothing really is happening. And yes, uh, it, it, it's not just the young people, but it is particularly the young people, certainly uh, lose um, urgency. Yeah. Uh, urgency is the wrong word because you, there's rarely a, a need for urgency, but they, lo they lose the... Um, uh, they're, just telling me, uh, they're just telling me rubbish. I feel fine. Uh, and ultimately, they stop going to the doctor. And yet, yeah, so I agree entirely with that... Uh, uh, that assessment, Stephen, I think you're spot on. Uh, so, yes, I was perhaps uh, a little bit glib to say crash landers um, uh, hide their head in the sand. Uh, I think we probably force their head under the sand uh, more than they hide their own head. Yeah, yeah. I, I think had I watched a lecture like this right at the beginning, I would have had a much better comprehension of, of what the journey that was in front of me entailed. Uh, yeah, so we, just need to, we just need to keep in touch enough so that we can plot what's happening uh, yeah. and then at the right moments begin to just turn the levers a little bit and make people more aware. But in the meantime, let them live their own lives. Just make sure that you keep contact. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Henning's been... Uh, uh, uncharacteristically silent. That was exactly the word I would have used. I'm in shock. Oh, it's almost three in the morning here, and um, <laughs> I <I've> wanted <laughs> to give voice to some of the other people. <laughs> Sorry, I should have thought of that. But, but thank you for the lecture. It was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. Good. Uh, it's probably, of all the talks I, I've listed, I think well, there's 11 of them, Dory, and uh, it's probably uh, uh, the least dialysis related other than the preparation. But the problem is that pretty much all of you uh, uh, have, have been there, done that. So it's, it's, it's like looking at what happened to you way back rather than what might be happening in real time. Uh, but the rest of the talks, I think, are, are, are more uh, specific towards dialysis. Uh, obviously, Henning, there's... Uh, 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 going to be a predominance of fluid coming up uh, in future talks, but uh, not tonight. All right. Any other questions? I just want to say thank you, John. Pleasure, Nancy. It was great. Always, always my pleasure. <laughs> But uh, was was uh, I guess uh, um, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back, but a, a question to you: Was that useful? Yes. Uh, yes, uh, did it uh, tread on your on toes that uh, I shouldn't have trod on? No, no, it was good. Um, my transplant's um, 20 years old now, and so it's it's good to know. Good. It, it was helpful. Yes. I remember right, so well, I'm just I'm a little baby. Go back to bed, Henning. Uh, and you too, Fez, because uh, I think you're about one or two o'clock in the morning. And that'd be about two o'clock? Half one. Half one. Okay. Uh, and you're half two. Is that right, Henning? That's correct. All right. <laughs> go to bed.
Definitely. Well, if you notice, I've been lying down a little bit. So <laughs> I'm halfway there. All right. Nice to see all your friendly faces. And we didn't be until like 5.30 here. <laughs> yeah, it's 8.30 here. Thank you, John. That was wonderful. If you, if you read the chat at all, there are all sorts of lovely comments. And we will um, post this recording once we get it all spiffed up and uh, pick a date for another one. And hopefully we see you all there. Just, just one, one thing. One comment Please. that reminds me. Where do you, how do people find these recordings uh, if they so wish? Uh, there is a link that I have posted on the Home Dialysis Central website and let me see if I can find it in my email and put it in the chat so that you all can... I, I spoke over the top of you then. What were you going to say? Oh, I um, said... I was, oh, sorry. Oh, I was just going to ask, are we allowed to share these videos? Please do. Yeah, because I'm part of a young adult kidney group on Facebook and some other um, Facebook groups kidney related. And I think they can be very informative for young people and others. Great. So it would be great to share. All right, let me find the link. Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, they're free and available. They'd be more free and available if I could find the link. All right, let's see. <laughs> my my con uh, comment was free and available, not freely available, but hopefully it's both. Well, cool, no problem. I cannot find the link right now, but Fez, you're in the Home Dialysis Central group too, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I so, joined it after the last talk. Um, Stephen told me about the talk and how good it was. So great. I joined in time for this one. Okay. Um, and then I also got another friend to join in who's camera shy. Um, but yeah, she's here somewhere. Um, and we're both young adults who are part of the Young Adult Kidney Group on Facebook, who are UK based. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so well, yeah, the message will be, it. yes, definitely share it far and wide. I cannot find the link right now, but I posted it already to the Facebook group. And if you want to message me or um, have me post it again, I can do that. It's not... One comment, Lori, I would make um, yeah. is if you're putting these out on, on Facebook or uh, any link and uh, you're sharing them perhaps fairs with others <coughs> remember that um, uh, anything I say is is uh, has to be taken as um, a general comment uh, it doesn't everything doesn't nor always mean you uh, so that people need to watch these uh, understanding that not everything that is said uh, will actually necessarily apply to them uh, I am not their, uh, their doctor. I don't know their personal circumstances. I don't know uh, uh, their lab results. I don't know their history, their disease, uh, or anything else. I'm uh, making um, uh, videos for, or these videos for Dory, uh, with, uh, as, as a general overview of the topic, rather than a specific advice to an individual. And I think that's important, Dory, and that should some form of, um, uh, what's the word? I can't think of disclaimer it. Disclaimer um, is the disclaimer. word. Disclaimer. Thank you very much. Yep. Yeah. I'll make sure I asterisk. And this is the link. I just found it and put it in the chat. And the challenge is I, we have to have a better way to find it. I don't know that I like advice from Dr. Agar. Um, feel free to propose a name because we went back and forth and didn't really come up with anything we loved. So awesome egot advice dot com. <laughs> Jesus. You gotta love the <laughs> It'll work for young people. I don't know if it'll work for older people. <laughs> but all you need is a hashtag and you're winning. Right. Anyway, I'll, look, I'll leave that to you, but um uh yeah, whatever comes up. I don't. All right. Well, I will talk to Christy about being able to find this on the website because it's way too much. advice from an old codger. That's what my family called me. <laughs> well, that's a possibility. You know, let me know. <laughs> you're, not, you're not old, John. <laughs> All right. Oh, thank, thank you for that, but I am. Uh, uh, right. Uh, I'm 
going to I'll have I'll raise a glass of Lafrague to you tonight and uh, thank you for listening. I will do like that. Glory, are we doing another one in two weeks' time? I believe that we could. Two weeks' time will be, let's see, looking at the calendar. Do, 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 do. October 12th. Uh, which one do you want to do? Uh, we can talk about that offline. Okay. We'll figure it out. Um, do you do them every two weeks? Yeah. Until we run out. <laughs> okay. I'm only... Um, thinking on the 25th of October is daylight saving time here in um, uh, the UK so it may potentially get later um, so maybe just try please to keep that in mind for us who are awake at like one two o'clock and for me it's daylight saving it gets earlier oh in that case yeah that's yeah, fine it'll well, be at 11 then or yeah, you, that's young, you young people can stay up later than us old people <laughs> <laughs> uh, we can try, but you know, partying and all that, it catches up with you. Yeah. Practice right. my bedtime. Thank you all for listening. Time. I'm going to sign off now. And uh, well, I'll have a look at. I, before I sign off, I'll just quietly read through the questions and comments and chat. There you go. Uh, and uh, that will help me in terms of understanding some of the things that. Uh, uh, popped into your heads while I was talking. So uh, well, thank you for those comments. They're important to me. And I'll look at those and then I'll sign off. If anybody else wants to um, unmute and just chat for a few minutes, we can just close this at nine. What's that UK time? <laughs> oh, sorry. On the hour. Whatever that hour is for you. All right. Okay. I'm happy, to stay, I'm happy to stay on if you want to chat, but uh, I think there should just be one time zone for the whole world, and it should be whatever time it is, and I don't care if it's the middle of the night and it's 8 a.m. Too bad. It's always 8 a.m. somewhere. Right? <laughs> That's it. Would make life so much easier in some ways. It would, but the globe's too big to do that. <laughs> but yeah, I don't mind chatting. I'm quite a chatty person. But if everyone goes, then I'll probably go. <laughs> All right. well, I'm going to I just think, Dr. Egar, the slides from last from, from the last lecture, um, yeah. I've spotted an error in it, or, or what I think is an error. It's in in the in the slides uh, in the four slides that are talking about the uh, the peak and trough of the the various um, yes. dialogue modes. Uh, the the third and fourth ones are talking about nocturnal treatment. And uh, you've got your, your uh, regular steady uh, peak trough, peak trough with a steady um, mean tox uh, toxicity level uh, on the red line. The slide just, after that. The slide after now. Yeah. I hope. Okay. Whoops. What happened? I feel just this, have to did, did you see that? No, no, no. No. Uh, let's oh, see. I know what I did wrong. Okay. Yeah, you should be able to share your screen if you want to try. Uh, I'm trying to do that now. Um, I'm shutting off the recording now. If I.